One summer week in 1975, the world changed. I remember walking out going, oh, wow. The shark comes out of the water for the first time. We're going to need a bigger boat, and we're going to need another bowl of popcorn. I just knocked this one over. Jaws was more than a movie. Its terror spilled out into the real world. That one old lady come up to me and say, I haven't had a swim. As a matter of fact, I haven't had a bar since I saw that film. With real consequences for real sharks. Jaws created this aura around white sharks where people want to go out and become quaint. How many sharks have I killed? You know, I don't keep count. Jaws inspired more than terror. It also inspired salvation. I think we're now starting to rally some support to conserve them. Jaws has changed the world by changing ocean awareness. No one would ever look at the ocean the same way again because Jaws changed the world. Jaws stunned and terrified audiences from the moment it hit the screen in 1975. The movie literally invented the summer blockbuster, turning director Steven Spielberg into a household name, as it had author Peter Benchley, who wrote the bestseller the year before. Benchley's inspiration was a news report of a 4,000-pound shark caught off the east coast of Long Island. We heard about a great white that was caught off of Montauk. This got him thinking that what if a shark like that hung around? When Peter wrote Jaws, our knowledge of sharks was really minimal. Like any good story, there is a grain of truth in it. And, you know, the rogue shark theory and rogue shark story in Jaws is a good one. Peter eventually studied sharks. And at the time, in 1974, there wasn't a lot of evidence that a rogue shark couldn't exist. You know, he was really writing what he knew. Benchley's research was limited by scientific proof. Gaps in facts were filled with fiction. Peter Benchley was writing what a lot of people thought. The fear of being eaten by a shark was a real fear. People had a feeling that a shark was after humans, and maybe once they tasted human flesh, they would stay. The monster of Jaws was born, a rogue great white with a very bad attitude. But transforming hit book into mega-hit movie was no easy job. Peter and I thought that Steven Spielberg did an absolutely superb job. I mean, he took uh, a novel and made it sing in so many different ways. It's hard to remember now that the filming of Jaws was a famous disaster. Nothing worked, including the oversized mechanical creature that was supposed to portray the killer shark. They first tested the shark out in California in the swimming pool and it worked fine. They were all excited, they were happy, like, hey, we did it, let's bring it to Martha's Vineyard. They stick it in the ocean, the pneumatics of it fizzled up in salt water and it just fell to the bottom of the hotel bay. It just set the tone for the rest of the movie where there was one disaster after another. And yet, the 27-year-old director refused to back down from his vision even tempting fate by enlisting real sharks to tell his story. This was considered a very bad idea at the time. Rodney Fox was recruited to get this real shark footage to intercut with the fictional action. They sent out a producer and this storyboard, and we had to paint bullet holes on a live great white shark. And in their wisdom from Hollywood, they sent out a broomstick with a sponge screwed into the end of it and a tin of red paint. And the instructions were, as the shark swims past the boat, plunge the sponge into the paint and press it onto the shark. So somehow I got the job of drawing the bullet holes on the shark's head. I got one bullet hole and the shark went away. And a bit of time later we lured it back in. I leant over the side. I was just about to put the bullet hole when the director said, no, no, don't stop. And I thought, oh, am I in trouble? What's going on? And I came back and my heart's beating and he said, you were two inches out. The cameraman jumped in the cage and we stood on the back and we thought, we're waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. We never saw that shark again. Rodney Fox needed no cinematic inspiration for being wary of sharks. In 1963, Fox had himself been the victim of a savage great white attack while spearfishing. All I remember is this big boat pushing me through the water. The picture that remains with me is, is a frightening one, is this great big head with its mouth and those white teeth coming straight up towards me through the red, which is my blood. And I thought, I have nothing to protect myself. What can I do? What can I do? And I kicked at the head as hard as I could. That gave me enough adrenaline to hold on, and I drifted like a leaf drifts down from a tree. I got to the surface and yelled out, shark, shark. After surviving this attack, Fox became an Australian hero. And 50 years later, shark attacks in these waters still make headlines. Headlines that seem to be taken right from the script of Jaws. 
And there are fears the menace has not gone away. A great white shark killed 32-year-old American. A 33-year-old was attacked by a shark. Shark appeared out of nowhere. He didn't stand a chance. The central dynamic of Jaws was a tourist community under siege. Are you going to close the beaches? In Australia, this dynamic played out yet again. Since September 2011, a beach community has experienced five fatal attacks, and it's widely believed that a great white is to blame. I would say go and capture that shark. It is my view that the authorities should destroy that shark. The great white shark is an endangered species. It should be destroyed instantly. I think it's time for a cull. As in Jaws, the community is still fighting over how to deal with the threat. Close the beaches, kill the sharks, if you fellas are concerned about the beaches, you do whatever you have to to make them safe. But those beaches will be open for this weekend. It doesn't matter what the culture is and what the language is spoken. I've seen the same kind of s scenes played out. This happens all over the world. In the movie Jaws, uh, of course, there was a, a replication of real-life occurrences. You yell shark. We've got a panic on our hands on the 4th of July. The usual pattern with shark attacks is that the first reaction is denial. That's not what you told me over the phone. The second one is a realization that it, it is happening and, and there's no getting around it. And then that's where the retribution comes in. Almost always there's a call for and oftentimes enactment of a sacrificial kill. Despite public awareness of recent fatalities, Perth was preparing for one of the biggest events in its calendar, the annual Rottenest Race, where 2,000 swimmers would face these shark-filled waters. Less than a week to go, the shark surveillance team has been called out. Four tiger sharks have been spotted in the area, and a decision was made to temporarily close the beaches. But plans for the race still go on. Every time I'm in the water, it's, it's something that I think about. It's always in the back of my mind. I have a little mantra, I'm a dolphin, I'm a dolphin, I'm a dolphin. Last year, Damien Frederick competed in the grueling 20-kilometer open ocean race, and he was not going to let a killer shark get in the way of his goal. A lot of people were very afraid when they first saw Jaws. A lot of people made the decision they weren't ever going back into the sea again. I deeply respect sharks. I know what they're capable of. It is their environment. When we do go into their environment, I think that we take responsibility for ourselves. As Damien swims, looking over his shoulder for sharks, He's soon forced to focus on the real threats to his well-being. There is no more lonely feeling than floating in the open ocean and vomiting your heart out. You're not allowed to hold on to the kayak, you can't touch the boat, you can't do anything. This time, Damien was lucky. He successfully navigated the shark-infested waters. Coming into the finish, you feel a little bit abandoned, but you can see the, the, the archway of the finish and you can see the crowd and you start at that point to be able to hear announcements and things like that. So there's a bit of an adrenaline that comes in and that that last 400 meters and I, I came up out of the water and I was really exhausted. The crowd was quite amazing. I got a really good cheer which was um, quite emotional. I was there with crutches and I got up onto my crutches and immediately fell down because my arms were so tired I couldn't support myself. So it just took me a little while to, to compose myself. In 1974, the year Jaws became a bestseller, Damien experienced the nightmare for real. I was 14 years old and I'd just recently become qualified as a lifesaver. We'd swum out to the set of waves that were furthest out when one of the boats suddenly went, swim, everyone swim to shore. We got two to three meters from the shore in water that was about a meter deep. I was just about to put my feet down when the shark grabbed me from behind. It grabbed my calf and shook my entire body out of the water and then dragged me under. And I can remember stretching up as the water came up and taking a breath and, and thinking that this was going to be the last breath that I ever took. In that moment, I was convinced I was going to die. The next thing I knew, I was being washed up on the shore. I started moving backwards and I was holding up my leg and I could see the calf was missing. And as the wave pulled back, there was just a lot of blood. Damien lost his leg below the knee, but he never blamed the shark. I take full responsibility of what happened. I think they have every right to be there and exist and do what they do. In fact, the shark that bit him might have been kept in line by the Great White, had they not been hunted out of the area, allowing more aggressive smaller sharks in. 
when I was bitten, great white sharks were actually hunted for trophies of teeth and jaws. The top predator had been taken out. It was a Zambezi shark, a, a bull shark, that attacked me. Jaws helped make the great white shark a villain, and real sharks bore the consequences. Jaws, the character, was the Godzilla of sharks. And it did what it was intended to do, which was to scare the hell out of people. And it did it effectively. Unfortunately for the white shark, it had a very profound backlash. It's a story that makes sense biologically, and that's what made it such a successful movie, is that it was based on a fear that we already had. Jaws led to public hysteria. After Jaws, Peter and I were just horrified that people took this fictional story and made it into a real thing and went out and started to hunt sharks. I mean, it was, it was devastating to us. Peter did everything he could to try to discourage it, but, but that was something that we just couldn't control. To some people, Jaws wasn't a work of fiction. It was an inspired instruction manual. If we had that movie Jaws filmed from our boat, it would have been a 10-minute movie. It would have been dead really quick. The 1975 release of Jaws changed everything for sharks. Overnight, they were among the most famous movie monsters of all time. But unlike Frankenstein's creation, great white sharks are real. And even in 1975, were fighting a real and losing battle against humans. Jaws created this aura around white sharks where people wanted to go out and become Quint. $10,000 for me by myself. For that, you get the head, the tail, the whole damn thing. There was a collective testosterone rush among American men. Any blue-collar guy could catch a big shark and get his picture taken. The decline in shark populations in the east coast of the United States began largely as a result of recreational fishing for sharks. How many sharks have I killed? You know, I don't keep count. A lot of people have tried to. 10, 20, 30,000. Some people say more. But I don't know how they come up with that figure. But uh, I've killed them since I was 10. You all know me. Oh, how I earn a living. Mark Portiano is the driving force of Mark the Shark's Monster Fishing Charters, an outfit that runs out of Miami, Florida. Mark's dedicated his life to one simple job, killing sharks. After the movie came out, people wanted to just kill and slaughter all the sharks. When I was fishing on the beach, I'd have people, surfers, actually thank me for catching the sharks right from the shore because obviously, you know, those sharks aren't swimming around with the people. If we had that movie Jaws filmed from our boat, it would have been a 10-minute movie. It would have been dead really quick. Ladies and gentlemen. Guardiano has nothing but contempt for commercial fishermen who take out dozens of sharks at a time on long lines. He prides himself on catching them one by one. I still have that passion. I mean, I still want to go out there and, and fish. I still want to go out there and hunt. I want to go out there and catch maybe the last one. photographer Chris Fallows has been hunting sharks for an entirely different purpose. He shot the first Air Jaws sharks on film. As humans, we'd be extremely arrogant to go and wipe something out that has been at the pinnacle of the evolutionary process for so long. This is an animal that's been around for 400 million years, and if for that reason and no other, it certainly deserves our respect. It's a tragic example of how ignorance is and has in the past killed so many magnificent animals that really deserve to be understood a lot better. But instead of being better understood, an epidemic of shark hunting swept the east coast of America. In the years after Jaws was released, the number of great white sharks around Cape Cod and Martha's Vineyard had significantly declined. Like Dr. Frankenstein, author Peter Benchley was horrified at what his creation had done. The one thing Peter and I could do was to counter the image of the fictional shark and go with what sharks were really like. The problem was, when Jaws came out, no one knew what sharks were really like. But we got a hands-on education, and we realized that the ocean was in trouble. And we also realized that Jaws gave Peter a unique platform. Never in my life have I seen anything like that. It just moves with this grace and power. I have never seen an animal like that in my life. There were so many articles and films with him in it, and he was trying to put the sharks into their true perspective that we need them in the oceans and live with them and not just kill them from fear. But it was really Jaws that helped the most. There was now a lot more interest in sharks, and this in turn helped fund a lot of new shark scientists. 
scientists inspired by another movie character. Who are you? Not who brought from the uh, Oceanographic Institute? There's a series of events that happened uh, after Jaws, and, and um, you know, unfortunately, some of it was quite negative. But what also happened after Jaws was there was somewhat of an explosion in marine science at the same time. Before that movie, we had no iconic figures of, of what an oceanographer should be like. Hello. Hello, Beck. Young fella, how are you? After the movie Jaws, we saw this surge in people wanting to study marine biology, and then there, suddenly there was all these universities offering programs. I don't need this working class hero crap. The Hooper character helped to dispel the, the stereotype of scientists as being really supple and gory. I'm not going to waste my time arguing with a man who's lining up to be a hot lunch. He's a sort of bearded, scruffy, irreverent kind of person, which is, it fits pretty well for most marine biologists. I have to take this abuse much longer. After Jaws, marine biology suddenly became a hot field. I mean, I'm obsessed with sharks to a certain degree. I've always been fascinated by them. Jaws entered the scene and acted like kind of a catalyst for me and really set home my desire to become a, a scientist, not only a marine scientist, but one that concentrated on sharks. And sometimes that means getting up close and too personal. It's hard to tell how many gallons of sperm are in here. A couple of gallons at least. than just scenes of mindless shark carnage. One of the most memorable moments is the pier side deception of a tiger shark, at first believed to be the Amity Island killer. The shark in the movie measures about 10 feet long, but try dissecting a basking shark nearly twice that size. It's a dirty job, and Greg Scomel's got to do it. Late last night, uh, my assistant John reported to me that he was watching a basking shark feeding in this area right here. And unfortunately, it drowned in the shallow water and it's left high and dry on the beach here. I saw Jaws in a movie theater when I was a young teenager. And uh, it, you know, it probably helped to change the course of my life. This is not the time or the place to perform some kind of a half-assed autopsy on a fish. That's amazing. Get ready to get wet. This is the liver right here. I was falling in love with the ocean as a young kid, and that really set it home for me that I wanted to be a marine biologist after I saw that film. Huge livers. I use them for buoyancy. Loaded with fat. Loaded with oil. Well, Hooper was one of those characters that I said, that that's a really, really cool job. See that nice rush of juice? Cup. Spinal tap, just like that. And, you know, maybe someday I can get one just like that. Here's the chest is here. Now we up your organ, the bonad, if you will. See how long it is, how big it is. No, it's a personal question. Sometimes we have to ask it. This is about as big as a gonad gets. All this machine does is swim and eat and make little sharks. We have these sperm packets right here that are indicative of a reproductively active male. It's hard to tell how many gallons of sperm are in here. A couple gallons at least. The killer shark in Jaws was enormous. Sharks don't get that big without living for a long time. But just how long do they really live? In 1975, science had no idea. Even now, no one knows for certain. Much of what we learned over the last three decades has centered on, you know, how fast they grow, how long they live, how often they reproduce, how many young they have. Really basic questions. I mean, this is really simple information that when I was a kid, I thought we already knew. Cutting through here is just like cutting through steak. But when you get down into the vertebrae, you've got to go between the vertebrae. After three hours of cutting, Greg has gotten to the part of the shark that keeps safe its secret. Now it's starting to come. It's got it where I want. Come on, honey. Oh. A detailed look at the vertebra column will provide the clues Greg needs to reveal the age of the shark. Mm. People don't even know how old sharks are. I mean, if they live two, three thousand years, they don't know. For like the rings in a tree, this vertebra may reveal their lifespan. You gotta be careful when you do this because it squirts out. It's like cracking an egg open. See that? Wow. <laughs> just like that. Perfect. Well, I'm just removing excess muscle. As long as I stay away from the calcified vertebra itself, I cut through it because it's all cartilage and connective tissue. So I've taken an individual section. We're gonna cut and slice it. Look at those rings, and they could potentially tell us how old the animal is. You can see these bands very, very clearly. And the real problem we have with sharks, though, is they're not trees, and we don't know how many bands are laid down per year. We do, however, have an event that occurred back in the 50s with a whole bunch of nuclear testing, and that created radiocarbon, which ultimately ended up in the ocean. And so this particular basking shark and any other basking shark living at that time absorbed radiocarbon, which created a chemical marker. And now we can look at where that chemical marker occurs in the backbone. We know when the shark died. We can look at the number of bands after that, and we can come up with the age of the animal. Until recently, it was thought that great whites might only live between 20 and 30 years. As is sometimes the case, science got it wrong. 
what we're finding out is quite remarkable. Take, for example, the most charismatic shark in the world, the great white shark. These sharks are living quite possibly twice as long as we ever thought. Dissecting a dead shark is one way to push the boundaries of science. Getting in the water with a live great white is quite a different matter. The Jaws movie certainly frightened a lot of people out of the water, but it also made a whole group of them more interested to learn more. This quest for knowledge can go to extremes. I certainly have my detractors, even within the scientific community, that think what I do is too risky, and yes, it is inherently dangerous. Jaws changed everything about the public perception of sharks. The fact that Jaws initially instilled a tremendous fear in people, I think elevated the animal to a status beyond any other marine animal. And as such, it created certain attractiveness about seeing the shark. The result of that is the incredible tourism boom we see in South Africa today. A lot of people spend three or four days in Cape Town, and I think the latest figures are showing somewhere upwards of 70 percent of people come here looking to see great white sharks. Today, in shark-infested waters in both South Africa and Australia, tourists can drop themselves into one of the most thrilling moments from the film. One, two, three. Okay, when you run, right now. Whoa. They all have one thing in common, including the scientists. After they've gone into the cages and felt they're in the shark's world, they feel the coolness of the water, and this big thing appears out and swims past, they come out exploding, almost like opening a bottle of champagne. The words pour out of their mouths in excitement. The golden vine there, well, it's only what you see as a white flash. It's just awesome and beautiful. Yeah, really, really fantastic. A few years after nearly being killed by a shark, Rodney Fox invented the protective cage, an invention that had a modest inspiration. It was only when I was walking my little niece through the zoo, looking at the lions and tigers, I realized they were behind bars and safe. Maybe I could build a cage and be safe by lowering that over the side. So I built the first underwater cage and we organized the first expedition to film great whites from the safety of a cage. With the failure of the mechanical shark back in Martha's Vineyard, Steven Spielberg turned to Rodney Fox to shoot the cage scenes with real great whites in Australia. In the novel and original screenplay, the Hooper character dies during this cage diving scene. As was the case with so much of the making of Jaws, everything that could go wrong in filming did go wrong. One big shark swam around, grabbed hold of the propeller of my boat and visibly shook the boat. And I can imagine from underwater, this is exactly what Spielberg wants, the shark attacking the boat. The shark let go of my propeller, swam down the side of the boat, got its head caught in the cage, the top of the cage, and started thrashing and crashing around tore the side out of the boat, part of the floor, the whole cage and the winch went over the side of the boat and we're rocking around like crazy. Unfortunately, the best shark action had been captured without the stunt diver in the cage. Spielberg had to choose between sticking to the original storyline or reworking the plot to include Fox's hard-earned shark footage. He decided to keep the real shark in and had Hooper escape. Spielberg said that if it wasn't for that sequence that helped to really liven up the film that he wouldn't have been half as famous he was quoted as saying that and if hooper hadn't escaped shark biology might have seemed a somewhat less inspiring career path but to jaws inspired biologist mark marks the cage just gets in the way of a shark cage. All I would learn is how sharks reacted to shark cages, which was minimal. It really says nothing about the nature of the animal. And the further I moved away from the confines of the cage, I was forced to really integrate myself with them and, and observe them much closer. So there is no false sense of security for me. These are large predators. They're powerful. So although they're not malicious, I've seen the result of when a white shark decides to treat a human being just like normal prey. I will never win that encounter. I certainly have my detractors, those within the scientific community that think what I do is foolish or too risky, and yes, it is inherently dangerous, and yes, I accept a certain level of risk, but I try to minimize that. 
Mark's research has provided extraordinary insights into the behavior of great whites. Research that illuminates a key fact that Jaws got wrong. They are not rogue solitary hunters. The part of my research I think I'm most proud about is being able to bust the myth of the white shark as a lone solitary hunter. White sharks are anything but lone hunters. In fact, they're extremely social. They move in small aggregate groups. There may even be cooperative hunting. Before I started working, we knew a lot about how they moved in their physiology, but very little about that social dynamic. Marx has researched another misunderstood cousin of the great white, the beleaguered white tip shark. White tips live in this open ocean because they've been able to exploit a very specific ecological niche. And they're very good at not missing an opportunity when it can apply. They do have a reputation for being bold and aggressive because they don't screw around. They come in very quick. And if it is a food source, they're going to capitalize on it. And because they are in such a large open space environment, they're quick to respond to disturbances such as subsurface explosions of ships sinking or planes crashing at sea. The oceanic white tip is the villain at the heart of one of Jaws' most chilling moments, the Indianapolis scene, a sequence improvised when once again Spielberg and company were stuck waiting for their mechanical shark to work. Do you want Indianapolis? Well, one of the standout scenes in the movie, and I think it's sort of like, it's almost the emotional center of the movie, is when, uh, when Quinn or Robert Shaw discusses his experience on the Indianapolis. So, oh, 1,100 men went in the war. 360 men come out, the sharks took the rest. You could hear a pin drop in the theater and in the scene. That brought that movie home to everybody and gave it a depth and a tragedy that I think would not have been there if Shaw hadn't done that speech so brilliantly. Well, we didn't know. If our bomb mission had been so secret, no distress signal had been sent. Once again, Jaws changed everything. One of the most heroic sagas of the Second World War had been mostly forgotten. The Indianapolis was the U.S. Navy vessel went down at the end of World War II, sunk by a Japanese submarine. It never got any attention in a big way until those, that one little line was uttered in Jaws, and, um, and then other people started to look into it as well. But once again, Jaws got it wrong. Sharks were not responsible for most of the deaths from the Indianapolis tragedy. Our investigation by talking to survivors and so forth revealed the loss of life directly due to the sharks was probably small compared to the loss due to exposure and dehydration and other injuries. And the so-called villain of the Indianapolis disaster, the white tip shark, is now facing a kind of disaster itself. Now they're so hard to find, there's only a few spots in the world where you can predictably go there and send these animals in just to be able to see one in the wild. Today in the Bahamas, these elusive white tips can be captured in revelatory film footage that shows shark behavior science never before knew was possible. Jaws changed everything we know about sharks, but not because it was a science documentary. It was a Hollywood horror movie, and the rogue monster shark acted the way it did in the service of shock, not science. If he is a rogue, and there's any truth to territoriality at all, we've got a good chance of spotting him between Cape Scott and South Beach. Like any good story, there's a grain of truth in it, and, you know, the rogue shark theory and the rogue shark story in Jaws is a good one. A lone shark hunting the same waters in search of human prey is great storytelling, but bad science. For one thing, they don't like the taste of humans. For another, they're highly migratory. We're learning more and more about these individual animals and finding out they don't stay put for any great length of time. So the likelihood of encountering the same shark or this so-called rogue shark again is really minimal. And all you're going to do is a whole bunch of collateral damage. And sharks are not loners. In fact, they may be far more social than previously believed. Some of the best evidence lies here in a community of Bahamian white tip sharks, accompanied by men swimming with them, armed only with cameras. Mark Marks not only swims with great whites, he goes in the water with white tips, and this time he has brought along other divers. Working with any large shark in open water, you have to stay vigilant. There's always a, a bit of apprehension when you're getting to know a new species. It's up to the shark to determine the outcome of any encounter. Oceanic white tips, being these large open ocean predators, live a very different lifestyle than a lot of the other sharks I study. And these guys are living up to their reputation. They're bold, they're inquisitive, they move in very quickly. 
we had several animals come up, two females, a male. The two females seemed to be confident they were bold. The male, he was much more skittish. They were coming in close, but there was no aggression here. This, these were animals that were curious. The one thing I'm absolutely convinced of with my brief view into the lives of these animals is that they are very social. They have such a tolerance for us and trust that we're not going to hurt them. They have no idea what we are, but yet human beings are so ill-tolerant to sharks. It's a rare shark to film. It's going to be even harder if nobody does anything for them. And considering that we know certain spots where they're at, these spots need to be protected, these animals need to be watched and studied and brought back to a good level. Jaws changed everything, especially for Peter and Wendy Benchley. Now our story comes full circle. A scientist inspired by fiction on an expedition with the creator's widow. One of the greatest compliments I ever got in a, it was a newspaper profile that was done on me. It said, Greg is what the character in Jaws, Matt Hooper, might have turned out to be like in middle age. I didn't like the middle age part, but I liked the part about this could have been Matt Hooper later on in his career. Soon after the release of Jaws, biologist Greg Stone met Peter Benchley. Benchley's creation transformed Greg's life, and he in turn has created an enduring scientific legacy. I met Peter not long after Jaws came out. I was a budding, uh, very, very young oceanographer. He was a uh, young but already successful writer, and we became great friends. We just hit it off. He was a great guy. We had a wonderful friendship together, and he was one of the ones who helped Peter to find his public voice to work on conservation issues. I had come from a career purely studying the ocean, and he had come from a career purely writing about it. Peter and I both started working in marine conservation about the same time. Today, Greg is one of the world's leading authorities on marine protected areas. Now, he and Wendy Benchley have traveled to Bimini Island to visit one of the longest running shark projects in the world. Through a study that I did over a three year period up in a small mangrove inlet, I color code tagged all these little sharks. It actually is one, yeah. So that's watch who was following who over a three year period and build like this big kind of social network, kind of Facebook of sharks. And I was able to determine whether certain individuals would follow other individuals of certain sizes or sex and I actually found that they had preferred partners that they would prefer to be in groups with, almost like friends. The species Greg and Wendy have come to see is the perfect example of just how far our understanding of sharks has come since 1975. Most people think of sharks as solitary, as aggressive, as dumb, mindless killers. But through using the lemon shark in Bimini, we're able to answer some very interesting behavioral questions about these sharks demonstrating that they're actually more social than we would expect, that they show personality, that they can even learn from each other. We know a lot more about oceans now, and we know a lot more about sharks now. And Peter often said, if I was going to write Jaws today, he said it would be a completely different novel. This is a great white line, a big one, and any shark expert in the world will tell you it's a killer, it's a man-eater. Look, the situation... Jaws was a nightmare to some, but to others, it was an inspiration. Being in that environment, it's like being in the breath of the ocean. You've got these very charismatic and important animals, the lemon sharks, that have found their way up into this remote little recess of the mangrove where they're safe from predators. And it's just the way the ocean should be. One, two, three. Rodney Fox has gone from shark victim to shark advocate. The Jaws experience and the incredible impact it had on people's lives has probably over the years helped to make them more popular and interested in buying books and magazines. The sharks are without a doubt the most popular things in the ocean. Human beings do love their monsters and they do like to be scared. To Wendy and Peter Benchley, the fate of these creatures is connected to our own through the ocean we share. We absolutely must protect sharks. They are the apex predator. They keep the balance in the ocean. They are what keep the ocean healthy. How arrogant it is for man to look down on sharks as a lower order of animal. This is an animal that is so better attuned to its environment than we are. For man to try to compete with it or destroy it for his own crazy purposes is madness. It seems to me that we ought to feel that we both cohabit the same planet. Jaws changed the world for us and for sharks. And today, after an absence of more than 30 years, great whites are back in Martha's Vineyard. Although we know far more about them, they still guard their secrets. Out of sight, perhaps, but never completely out of mind. It's this creature that lives out there in the depths of the water, in the depths of our subconsciousness. A part of me says, I would like to not know everything about these animals. To me, the mystery is one of the things that keeps it the enigma that it is.